Welcome to Live Like an Acrobat. I'm your host, Shanae Stiletto, two-time world champion in acrobatic gymnastics, USA Gymnastics Hall of Fame member, and Cirque artist. Please remember to check out extended conversations and interactive content of each episode of the Live Like an Acrobat podcast on the circuspreneurblog.com. Please consider making a donation to encourage the continued growth, expansion, and evolution of this podcast. On today's show, I have the pleasure of interviewing Seesaw creator and founder, Sierra Rhodes Nichols. today's show is using her platform Seesaw, which already provides fantastic practical resources for circus students and circus artists in a brand new effort inspired by the ongoing fight for true structural and systematic change to provide even more support. And this time, her focus is on the BIPOC circus community. Sierra Rhodes Nichols recognizes her privilege as a soon-to-be graduating circus artist that is not of color and is focused on how she might better create a more equitable road for her circus peers of color and for the generations to come. Sierra is not only taking action, but is choosing to do so during an incredibly precarious time as she and her graduating class will soon be sent out into a very different circus industry which has been severely impacted by the global pandemic. True activism is done regardless of the convenience of time. To inconvenience yourself in order to be of service to others is to be the change, because discomfort stokes the fires of transformation. Sierra is an ally to the BIPOC circus community, and I hope that if you are seeking to be of use, whether you in the circus arts or not, that her example will assist in evolving the narrative of what tangible action looks like. Please allow me to introduce my special guest, Sierra Rhodes Nichols, to the show. gymnast in Montana. Always upside down, she decided to pursue a career in circus arts. Sierra received formal training as a hand balancer from Corey Tobino at the school formerly known as Circus Maine. She will now be going into her graduating year at Circadium School of Contemporary Circus in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. There she double majors in partner acro and hand balancing with a minor in foot juggling. Before arriving at Circadium, Sierra spent three years applying and auditioning for circus schools. She ended up applying for 28 schools and auditioning for 11. In her time as an aspiring circus student, Sierra found that information about circus schools, applications, and auditions was extremely hard to find. This is what inspired her to found CSAW, Connecting Circus Students Around the World in 2018. The mission of Seesaw is to assist circus artists in finding the pathways best for them by providing an increase of knowledge, resources, community, and financial aid. You can learn more about their various programs at www.seesawcircus.org. CSAW, Connecting Circus Students Around the World, is committed to taking action against racism in the circus community. Seesaw launched an Indiegogo fundraiser on July 1st called Seesaw Micro Grants for U.S. Circus Artists of Color. They are raising $15,000 to actively support representation and equality for the future of circus. Once the money is raised, grantees will be chosen through an application process and reviewed by a selection committee composed entirely of circus artists of color. These grants will be available for circus artists of color to pay for circus education, private lessons, tuition fees, audition expenses, etc., or other circus pursuits, shows, videos, any project that has an immediate need for funding and meets the application criteria. They are hoping to provide one grant each month beginning September 2020 
until August 2021. Seesaw is hoping that this will be the first of many financial aid and funding opportunities that they are able to provide to the circus community. Hi, Sierra. Thanks so much for coming on to the show. It's so lovely to meet you. Hi, Shanae. Yeah, thank thank you. I'm very excited to be here. Um, very honored and just really grateful for your podcast. Um, really grateful to have encountered your Black Circus Lives Matter podcast and um, the other ones that you've been doing and for all of your work for advocating in both the acrobatics, gymnastics community and the circus community. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for making your podcast and, and helping educate our communities. And I'm really honored to be here. Thank you so much, Sierra. I'm super, super honored as well. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. And so I, I wanted to start straight away with acknowledging your current fundraising effort for artists of color. You are efforting to raise $15,000, which will provide a micro grant of $1,000 per month for circus artists of color spanning over the course of a year or so. So where are you in terms of reaching your goal? And please tell listeners about your great effort. What what inspired you to create the fundraiser through your platform, Seesaw, which is short for connecting circus students around the world to support and encourage continued growth for the BIPOC circus community? How is your selection process being handled to determine who will decide which candidates will receive the grants? What do you want others within the circus arts community who are not of color to know about stepping up to this issue that can enliven their efforts to push for change? Yeah, so I I started Seesaw two years ago, um, and it, the question that I received the most often, um, or that I have received the most often in my time since starting it has been, um, are there any financial aid opportunities? Uh, are there any scholarships that you know of? Are there any grants that you know of? Is there any circus-specific funding um, that you can point me toward? And it's been it's been disappointing and discouraging uh, to most often have to answer that question with I don't know of any or there aren't any um, and so I I've for a long time I've wanted seesaw to start to provide some of those resources um, and then also yeah also with the current the current political climate uh, and to address address some of these issues of representation and a lot of what we've been hearing from the community right now. Um, we started this fundraiser because it really, it felt like an intersection for us um, of kind of providing some of that financial aid that is necessary and then also helping to support the future of representation in circus. Um, and so we, this project started about a month ago now and it took on a lot of forms. Um, I started it with my acro partner, Kevin Flanagan. He and I are both Circadium students currently. Um, and we we initially were thinking of starting a scholarship for Circadium specifically, um, and Circadium is the uh, the only higher education school for circus in America. It's in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, um, and so we looked into that route a little bit, and then we also looked into the route of making a singular grant. Uh, but we we spoke to the community a lot, and we did a lot of research, and had some amazing and generous uh, conversations, and. It really this this pathway became clear to us that we wanted to provide multiple grants if we could. Um, so we looked into making Seesaw a nonprofit and to becoming fiscally sponsored. Uh, and we're still I'm still doing the work to really establish those things for Seesaw to help with the longevity of these projects. Um, but we we also wanted to launch this fundraiser to help help with an immediate need for the community um, and to start start really taking action as soon as we could. Um, yeah. And so that, that's what caused us to launch this fundraiser. And we are, we're 5,500 in as of today, the fundraiser has been live for a week now. It launched on July 1st. Um, we launched it via Indiegogo. So we're over a third of the way to our goal, which is super exciting. Um, as much as people can keep donating and sharing and supporting our fundraiser, we're super appreciative mm -hmm. of, um, we really, yeah, we were passionate about starting this to uh, take 
take action against racism and to really um, create create an opportunity and funding opportunities to address some of these issues within the community. So we've received really amazing support so far from from circus schools and studios and individuals um, and from yeah, from really generous people like you who are using their platforms to help us promote the fundraiser. And we're super excited and hopeful to reach that $15,000 goal soon. Wow, that's awesome. I know that you will reach your goal and I'm sure that you will go beyond your goal. So I just wanted to ask, what is the selection process that will go into determining the candidates uh, that will receive the grants. I know that you have a board, you have a special panel, they're all people of color. And is there a criteria? Have you figured that out yet? Are you still kind of um, figuring out those details of what it will take or what you're going to be looking at or what kind of specifics that will be um, necessary to receive the grant? Yeah, for sure. So we, um, as you said, we have a selection committee um, and the selection committee is composed entirely of circus artists of color. Um, we we aren't at liberty ever to disclose the identities of the selection committee. Um, and that's that's just for reasons of conflict of interest and also to protect them. Um, but we we've drafted an application for the grant and we're thinking that we're hopeful that we'll release the first application on August 15th and it will be open until September 15th. And when it closes on September 15th, the selection committee will review the applicants and based on the application criteria and conversations they have amongst themselves, uh, they will choose the recipient of the first grant. So we're very hopeful that the first grant will go out to somebody on October 1st of this year um, should, should we meet that fundraising goal. And even if we don't meet our fundraising goal, uh, we have grants secured already for September, October, November, December, and January. Um, so we will for sure be releasing that application criteria and, um, and making those first grants happen. And the application isn't live yet. It's still being revised a little bit and um, advised by our selection committee on what needs to change with it. But it will, yeah, it'll be released soon and it'll be available on Seesaw. And we're hoping to send it to um, social circuses in the community and really to everybody that we can to raise awareness that the grants will become available. Mm, okay. What do you want others within the circus arts community who are not of color to know about stepping up to this issue that can liven their efforts to push for change? Yeah, so um, myself and my acro partner, Kevin, uh, who helped helped me start this micro grant program, we are both white. And we so in the beginning, we had a lot of conversations about addressing the racism that exists within ourselves, um, the things that we still need to work on and try the implicit biases that we need to keep addressing um, every day to help the circus community and then the community at large. Um, and we also it's been very crucial to us in the campaign efforts that we're, we do everything we can um, to not center ourselves. And we're trying to really center people of color as much as we can. Um, we're very, very thankful to the amazing artists who volunteered to be in uh, our promotional video and to the circus artists of color that have taken time to talk with us about these things. Um, we, we really did what we could and we continue to do what we can to avoid white saviorism and to avoid tokenizing these artists. Um, and we're super open. We're super open to feedback still um, and super open to being called out. However, however people feel the most comfortable doing that. Um, and yeah, to, to the other circus artists in the community who aren't of color, um, we just ask them to really leverage their privilege at this time to be super open to hearing what the circus artists of color in the community have to say and to doing everything that we can to help. Um, of course, starting, starting with listening and understanding and empathy and then doing what we can to turn those things into action so that we can start to really actively address uh, the issues that are coming, um, that are coming up that people are willing to share. And yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. 
Sierra, is this an issue you've always been aware of within circus arts? Your platform seeks to give resources to circus artists seeking circus training and eventual employment. Have you seen disparity within this firsthand by who reaches out to Seesaw or who you mostly come into contact with seeking resources or any direct stories you'd like to share from BIPOC circus artists? And if not, what is the common thread for those coming to your platform seeking assistance? Yeah, so I, um, I mean, a little bit of background about myself. I, I was a gymnast as well. Um, I grew up in Montana in the United States. Um, and there really, there really isn't circus here <laughs> to speak of. Um, and so I, I myself had a lot of challenges in finding information about how to make circus a career. Um, I knew I really wanted to, I knew I really loved performing and I really loved acrobatics and handstands. And um, I wasn't, I wasn't sure how to make that a pathway for myself. So I had a friend a couple of years older than myself who I went to school with and who I trained gymnastics with. And she went to ENC in Montreal and that was the first time I had ever heard of circus school. Um, I didn't know that it existed before she auditioned and got in and went. Um, and so I I spent three years auditioning for schools and I didn't get into ENC um, any of those three years. And the second year I auditioned for ENC and ECQ and didn't get into either of those places. So the third year I took it upon myself to learn everything I could about the circus schools that exist um, everywhere in the world instead of, instead of just focusing on the North American ones. So yeah, I, for sure in my experience um, and that was in 2018 that I did that. It, it was very clear to me that um, the resources and the information on circus schools, it was just very hard to find. Um, the, a lot of the websites are outdated. A lot of the questions you have are very hard to find answers about. Um, and so I've kind of, I've known since starting Seesaw that that, that is a need. Um, and that's a need that we are working, working to fill as much as possible. Um, in terms of people of color trying to access the information, um, I, I do, I've had a couple of instances for sure. The there's a school in Chile called El Circo de Mondo, um, and that's it's the circus school, yeah, in Chile in South America. And I've had really generous and wonderful conversations um, with one of the directors of those schools, who's uh, shared with me the experiences there and how oftentimes it's very hard for their students to find the information they're looking for, and very hard to find it in the language that they need it in. Um, which makes filling out applications very difficult. And in terms of the financial side, I do, because I attend Circadium, I've had uh, quite a few people reach out to me about, about Circadium and about the financial aspect of Circadium. And um, there was a student this year, a student of color, who was hopeful to come to the school and who auditioned and got in. And um, they, they reached out to me and told me that they weren't able to come because of the financial cost of Circadium. So we it it feels clear to us that the need is certainly there we're hoping we're hoping in part that uh the year long micro grant program and having multiple grant recipients will also provide us with information on where the need is most um because the grant will be available for circus education um but it'll also be available for creating circus shows or videos due to the pandemic or anything that fits the application criteria, we are, we are hopeful that um, receiving those applications and the grant recipients will help us gather information to identify where the financial need lies most for circus artists of color right now. Um, we have some ideas and I have had some experiences with it, but I'm certainly, there's nothing conclusive for us yet. So we're, we're hoping to still gather that information as much as we can. Mm. That's wonderful. Sierra, how do you see yourself expanding beyond reaching your goal with this grant program? You just spoke about expanding the grants and to not just assist for circus schools, but to assist for, you know, starting a show and videos and other things. But do you see any limitations of providing just the grant that you want to in the future supersede the grant or just include or expand on it? Is there any 
Is there an expansion of this grant program that you have in mind that you're already looking towards uh, into the future that you think could maybe be a great evolution of this program if it continues to gain momentum and the support that it needs? Yes, definitely. Um, I am. I'm in talks currently to see see if I can make Seesaw partner with uh, an already existing nonprofit. Because, yeah, as I mentioned, um, it was a barrier for us starting this this fundraiser that we weren't able to do it through a tax deductible method. Um, so I am I am working to make Seesaw either its own nonprofit or to partner with another nonprofit so that in the future donations can be tax deductible to to motivate donors and to help with the longevity. Um, I do also, yeah, we we talked a lot about in creating the micro grant program that um, you know a thousand dollars is great and is helpful, but it's also in the scheme of things, not very much. Um, it goes it goes away quickly, especially especially for show creation and for tuition. And yeah, we we're very help, hopeful. Um, if the micro grant program doesn't become an an annual program, if we don't run it every year, we will certainly be looking to provide other types of grants um, and ho- hopeful to provide grants in larger sums of money for, for both people of color and also for, um, for white circus artists and the entire community at large, um, both, both for circus education and also for other, other projects as well. So I am, I'm very hopeful that Seesaw can start to provide some of those financial resources that people have asked me about so often and, um, and I haven't been able to provide so far. Mm, that's fantastic. Sierra, as a circus artist yourself, what has been your own journey as a circus performer? What, is, what has it been like? What have been the challenges and successes? What do you see as the most imminent advice to give to circus artists, no matter where they are in their careers and no matter what color they are? Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned, um, I started, I started as a gymnast, uh, and I, I was very, very fortunate because I did, I competed for about four years. Um, and I found, I really didn't enjoy competition. Um, and my mom actually reminded me the other day that I, I quit comp- competing when I was 11 and I came up to her and said, I don't want to compete anymore because I root for the other people more than I root for myself. <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> instead I am very, very lucky that there's a program here uh, in Missoula, Montana called Roots Acro Sports, um, which provides a performance gymnastics track. Um, and so I started, I started doing that when I was 10 years old to, perform in exhibitions and halftime shows. And it was very much acro dance based. And we did a little bit of partner acro. Um, Nobody ever called it circus, although some of what we did, I think was very close to circus. Um, But so I I did that program for, for eight years. Um, And then, yeah, as as I said, my my friend Marina Cherry, um, a couple of years ahead of me, auditioned and got into ENC. And so when I was 17, um, I auditioned for ENC for the first time and I didn't make it in. And so I went to a professional program um, in Maine at a school formerly known as Circus Maine. Um, they're unfortunately no longer in business, but they had a professional program there. And I studied as a hand balancing apprentice under Corey Tabino. While I was there, um, and Corey was a Cirque du Soleil artist in Kidam, and he went to ENC years ago, and so wow. I'm I'm really thankful for my time there. I spent about two and a half years at Circus Maine. Um, the second year that I was there, I decided to audition for ENC again and ECQ as well, and I didn't get into either of those schools, and that was that was a very hard moment for me and my. Um, my career has been short (laughs) so far, but that was, that was a moment where I was really discouraged, um, in, in continuing circus because I felt like I didn't know about other circus schools. And I felt like if I couldn't get into ENC or ECQ, I, I couldn't really see the pathway for myself, um, anymore. And I'll never forget. It was, I, I had almost decided to quit circus and to go to a traditional college instead. Um, 
and I was on my way back from New York from a gig that I was doing there. And on the way back, we stopped to watch Cuisine and Confessions um, by the Seven Fingers. And I watched that show and just thought it was incredible. And after after I saw it, I knew that I couldn't quit circus. Um, I knew that I had to keep going. So I I decided to go completely all in in my third year of auditioning for schools. And I applied for 28 circus schools. Um, I ended up live auditioning for five and video auditioning for six. So that was 2018. And that year was crazy <laughs> for me. Um, it really... It became it became a full time job applying for schools, and I also, you know, I didn't I didn't apply to every single school with really the intention to audition for twenty eight schools because that would have been impossible. But I, it became a research project for me. Um, I really became passionate and interested in all the different schools that are out there in the world and and what their applications are like. Um, and that that was when I first encountered the the issue that I mentioned that the resources and the information is is just hard to find, um, you know, not only not only because of language barriers, but also it's just it's different country to country. Um, like Isaac, Isaac in uh, Brussels, for example, their application process requires that you send them like upwards of. 24 documents um <laughs> and you have to send it to them by mail and one of those things is an x-ray of your spine um which is like it's totally feasible for some people in Europe and for like universal healthcare and things like that I guess but um I just I ended up emailing them and I was like hey uh in the application process it says you need an x-ray of my spine um you know I healthcare isn't like fantastic over here and I can't really get that done. Um, and I, I also emailed them and said, uh, I can't really mail in all of those things to you either. You know, it's very expensive to mail all of them. And they wanted, they requested that you mail your birth certificate. So it was just, it was all of these things that, um, that I felt empowered, I guess, to, to ask the school, are those really necessary? Um, and it was quite amazing because I did that in an few instances it wasn't necessary you know they were like no that's okay um you can just send us scans of all these things by email and I was like oh well that's great but the reality is also that information like that that it's okay to send by email um and isn't it's not published you know they don't they don't really say that on their website um you can't find that information anywhere and so a lot of a lot of people are deterred by that and um you know, a lot of people don't don't want to go through the extra labor of emailing with the school and asking and putting yourself in that vulnerable position of, oh, man, I want to go to this school. But their first impression of me is going to be this email where I'm asking a bunch of questions, you know. Um, and so it was it was things like that. And also just, you know, out, outdated circus school websites. Um, hard to find applications, hard to find the application deadlines, a lot of things that I I felt like. If if I was having a hard time with, I, I kept wondering, are other people also struggling with this? Um, and so I, I did end up going to Circadium uh, in Philadelphia in, in 2018, yes, <laughs> that, that same fall. Um, and that that's when I started Seesaw, connecting circus students around the world, um, because I really felt that I wanted... I'm really grateful that I spent three years auditioning and applying for schools and it really, um, it made a big difference in my life and it, it motivated me to start Seesaw. But I also, you know, I believe that if I had known about more of the schools when I was younger, when I was 17, that first year I was auditioning, I would have auditioned for more. Uh, and I would have maybe found, found my pathway a little bit sooner, um, and had, had a little bit less of, of a struggle in finding it. Um, and so, so I wanted to help future students, with some of those resources um, and with finding that information, I just I wanted to start to provide the pathway because it can be very, very intimidating to decide that you want to become a professional circus artist. You know, um, I think in the States, we're quite familiar with the financial barriers to doing that, the financial barriers to even applying for a circus school and then traveling to audition and then 
paying for tuition once you get in. Those things are difficult. But even before you get to all of that, just learning about the schools is very difficult. So the first program I started is called the Ambassador Committee. And the Ambassador Committee selects a representative from each circus school uh, to be there as a current student of the program to answer questions for for anyone who's interested in the program. So the goal there is that, um, and we currently have 14 ambassadors from 14 different circus schools around the world, which is really exciting. I think we started with like four. <laughs> so it's been, it's been good to grow that program. Um, but really the purpose, the purpose of having them is that you can ask a current student of a program really real questions about it. Um, like I, I could reach out to the ambassador of any one of the schools and say, hey, what do you think about the handstand coach there? Um, and that's that's just something that you can't Google, that you can't find on the website and that you can't email the school about. Like if you email the info at whatever school and ask them what they think of their coaches, mm-hmm. <laughs> they're not they're not going to be able to say anything other than they're great, you know. Um, so really. The ambassadors are there to to help um, answer any any questions that students might have about future programs and and to hopefully provide a more more personable interaction and and faster uh, method of gaining information in that way. So that that was the first project that Seesaw um, started on, and and after that we partnered with Circus Talk uh, for about a year to help develop. Uh, some of their educational resources and also to have them help spread the word about Seesaw and help us provide articles and resources. And that was a really fantastic and wonderful partnership. Um, it ended, I, I discontinued my employment with them back in February, but um, we still continue to talk and to uh, help each other with articles and things like that. I'm, I'm grateful for the time that Seesaw spent partnered with Circus Talk um, and yeah, since since then it's been um, this work on becoming a nonprofit and this work on grants. But that that's a bit of an overview of what led me to Seesaw. And um, separately from that, I I am going into my graduating year at Circadium, and I double major in handstands and partner acro there, uh, and I minor in foot juggling, which is a new new discipline for me and a lot of fun and very hard, <laughs> um, but. I guess I think you asked me um, what my advice would be to to any circus artist. And I mean, yeah, I think it would be to ask for help from your community um, as much as you can, as much as you feel comfortable in doing so. Um, I really feel I think in in your interview with Jonathan Lee Iverson, he um, he said that this that COVID-19 had been kind of a a beautiful embarrassment, I think is what he said for everybody. And I thought that was a really, a really lovely way to describe it. Um, You know, it's been, it's been devastating for the entire world. Um, And it's also really flipped, flipped life on its head for a lot of people. We, we've had more time to reflect and um, we're learning to connect in different ways. And I, I feel in the circus community that, you know, even since this started, I've met so many more amazing people all virtually, obviously, but um, more people than I ever knew before in circus. And I think, I think it's really our responsibility now to, to help each other, um, you know, to amplify the voices of circus artists of color and to, to make our industry better. Um, Circus Talk, they they released that first panel, the wake up call for inclusion. Um, and Joseph Finzan in that panel, he said, we have we have the opportunity to rebuild our art form. And if we don't rebuild with representation on stage, then the art form has failed. Um, and that really I think I've thought about that every day since he said it, because it's true. You know, circus circus is facing such a strained moment in its history. Um, we're seeing, we're seeing the impact of COVID, you know, hit, hit our small local home studios and all the way up to Cirque du Soleil. It's, it's everybody. Um, and so it's, it's a hard and frustrating time to be a circus artist. And 
it comes with a lot of questions. And while we're still not really able to perform, or maybe we can perform virtually, I think it's exciting and, and motivating to me to see the other things that we can offer the circus community, um, the other the other crucial things that we need in order to grow, you know, beyond beyond the training that we have to do to maintain our bodies and beyond all the beautiful things that performance can offer. It's, it's a moment, I think, for us in the industry to, to see what else we can do, to see how we can use this time to, to come out of it better and to, when things reopen and we can relaunch and we can gather again to make sure that we're not just going back to how things work, but we're actually we're actually ready to grow. We're actually to say we're going to change and mean it and follow through and take action and, and change. Mm, beautiful, beautiful and very inspiring, Sierra. Thank you. Sierra, what, do, what else do you want to add for the BIPOC circus community? How... What words do you have of continued encouragement for the BIPOC circus community as this new wave of representation and basically, uh, you know, um, artists that are not of color standing for us? What words of encouragement do you want to provide as everyone continues, of course, during this very difficult period and this difficult time? But what else do you want to give voice to the experience of BIPOC circus artists just to also continue to enlighten those within the circus community that are still maybe searching for the ways to understand where their place is in supporting the BIPOC circus community that I myself am a part of, if they are maybe confused about their verbiage or just their own personal views. Um, so this is kind of like a two-part question. So it's like, first, what would you say to the BIPOC community? But this is also to in reflecting because it will assist in others that are not a part of the BIPOC community to, I think, gain a lot of clarity around how they can best support and that there's so many different ways that you can support the BIPOC circus community, obviously. And to me, it feels that there is, there is, there's nothing that's of, of lesser importance. I, I really, I really want to drive that home. I think that everything has value. You providing any level of resource or sympathy or empathy um, that you can is valuable in the direction of somebody else's suffering, especially in a space where there is such a such a divide or such an inadequacy of our voices um, as there continues to be. So I think that all of those things are valuable and precious. So what would you like to say? Um, continuously to the um, BIPOC artists community? I think, I mean, the biggest thing that I would like to say is, is just thank you. Um, you know, thank you. Thank you for the generosity in speaking out about the things that you have faced and, and thank you for your patience um, as, yeah, as, you've had to wait for people to realize these things that have always been a part of your life um, and that are your lived experience. And um, I'm, I'm trying my best to be a good ally during this time, but I know, I know that I'll make mistakes and I know that I'll never understand. And so I want to be very, very open to uh, conversations with people, discussions with people, um, you know, to being called out and made aware of, of the ways that I will inevitably fail in, in trying my best to be an ally. Um, and I also, yeah, I also want to offer my support in, in any way that I can give it. Um, I, I want people to feel free to reach out to me. Uh, something we talked a lot about in creating the fundraiser is that, you know, fi finances are certainly not the only barrier to representation in circus. Um, the systemic racism reaches so far and affects things so widely. Um, and so, you know, because of COVID-19 and a, a whole lot of reasons, not everybody's in a place where they can give financially right now. And, and that's so understandable and okay, but there are, there are other ways to give, you know, um, you can you can be amplifying voices of circus artists of color. You can be educating yourself every day. Um, you can be doing doing everything you can to help put people of color in leadership positions um, and to 
yeah, to, I think, yeah, listening, listening is very huge and is everything, but I also, you know, as you're saying, um, everything counts and any, any action that you can take, I think, I think is great and is wonderful. And yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue to do, uh, to do my best being an ally and, and be really open to what that means and how that needs to change and evolve every day. Um, and I am, I'm hopeful I'm serving as the volunteer executive director position of Seesaw right now, but, um, because, because I do want to pursue a performance career, but also because I'm, I'm not the best person to continue this project. There are, there's somebody out there who has um, more knowledge and more experience and more resources than I do who can make Seesaw even better. Um, I do, I really want the executive director and the board of directors to be people of color um, so that they, they have the leadership in the community and, and that they can continue some of these projects. Um, and yeah, I think, I think that, that would be what I would say is, is primarily thank you. Um, and then also to encourage, yeah, to encourage people in our community who aren't of color to, to do what they can to be allies and also to, to acknowledge and offer that, um, I will do it imperfectly. And so I want to, I want to approach that as humbly as I can. And, um, also as thankfully and gratefully as I can to, to everybody that has, spoken with me about this so far and also that I'm very open to continue dialogue about it. Mm, wonderful. Sierra, how can the community at large support your platforms? What is your biggest necessity moving forward? For sure, um, donations. If you're in a place to even give five or ten dollars, um, everything Everything and anything will help us get to that fifteen thousand dollar goal to to secure the micro grants for a whole year. Um, and yeah, if if you're not in a place to donate right now, which is completely understandable, um, anything that anybody can do to help spread the word uh, is very appreciated. Um, as many people as many people as possible learning about the fundraiser um, will help us reach that goal. And then beyond that. Um, yeah, if if you're interested in the other work that Seesaw is doing with the ambassador committee or anything else, um, feel free. We have a website, seesawcircus.org, um, where there's a lot of information on there. Um, you can find my information and, um, and ask me questions as well. And yeah, if, you, if you're passionate about the work that Seesaw is doing, if you want to learn more about it, um, you can email us, seesawcircus at gmail.com. And yeah, for, for now, it's really the the big goal of meeting our, our fundraisers so that we can release those applications and start making those grants live for people and then continuing the work that Seesaw is doing to help it become a financial resource for the long term. Thank you, Sierra, for coming onto the show and for using your platform to support the BIPOC circus community and the circus community at large. I appreciate everything that you are inspired to do and that you are wasting no time in taking real action that will have an effect on BIPOC artists in real time, especially during such a time as these when so many within the circus community are struggling and will continue to struggle for some time as the world continues to be shaken. Thank you for being open, present, and aware, and for not turning away from injustices, discriminations, and the prolific bias that exists within the circus community at large. I want to remind listeners to support your micro-grant fundraising campaign again by donating and spreading the word to those outside of the circus arts community, and to continue to support your progressive activism through your platform, as I'm sure you will continue to create new avenues that are beneficial in affecting the circus arts environment for the better for years to come. So thank you so much, Sierra, for your time. Thank you, Shanae. It's been an honor to be on your podcast.
Thank you for joining me on this episode of Live Like an Acrobat. I'm your host, Shanae Stiletto. Please stay tuned for the next episode of the Live Like an Acrobat podcast. Until next time, please stay safe and stay healthy.